Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakat and welcome to a very special edition again on this Finding Me in the ITV Networks with two very dynamic women who have contributed to riding the Samusa Express. In the previous conversation, we opened the whole notion of culture and religion and of course the taboos that many Muslim women face and are being challenged with. Uh, one of the discussions was around the ideal partner and the question of is there such thing as an ideal partner? I think what is very important and the message that should be carried out is that there is no such thing as the ideal partner or the ideal family, but there is an ideal way in which you treat your partner and an ideal way in which you treat your family. And what is important is that almost a third of the injunctions in the Quran focus on the family. And almost every injunction regarding the family in the Quran unequivocally stresses that you should treat your family or your spouses with respect that there should be mawadda and there should be rahma. Now, the opening in, in this book, one of the comments that is raised is that the collection begins with a story that sets the scene around the concept of marriage in the context of religion and culture. And perhaps that is the multi-million dollar question that many are trying to unpack in terms of the challenges that Muslim women face. And so with that, I'd like to say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to both you, Safiya Ismail and Sumaya Kauda. Thank you very much for being here, making this time, and for unpacking this, these challenges of religion and culture, and of the treatment of spouses, as you have both mentioned and written in your particular contributions to the Samosa Express. But let, let's begin, Safiya, by you introducing yourself to my audience. Okay, so I'm going to your audience. Um, I'm Sophia Ismail. I am um, a mom to a 22-year-old son, Ridwan, who was actually mentioned in the book. I am working in the aviation sector. Okay. So it's very interesting and when very you say challenging. When you say aviation sector, I can't help thinking about Riyadh Musa, you know, when he says when the Muslim <laughs> when the Muslims get onto the plane and yeah. if you ask for a halal meal or you're just fast on the seat okay, belts so and all of those I'm things. I'm actually on the opposite end. We okay. fix those aircrafts. Uh, right. I work for a company called Interjet Maintenance and okay. we're based out at Lanseria Airport. And we fix like how you take your car in for a service people bring their planes into a service. <laughs> okay. So it's a very uh, challenging environment and I'm learning a lot like from a challenger to a Gulf Stream. So for me it's very exciting because I'm like... Okay, but like, from, from again, from this technical aspect there is a huge amount of creativity, right? Yes. Because you, you've been yes. involved with different mainstream media. Yes. And, and if you would like to share that with us. Oh, I'm actually doing a lot of marketing and communications for my company. So I write the articles for all the different magazines that feature aircrafts. Okay. So I write, I put in adverts, I do all the, ad, the publicity, anything that needs to go to nationally or internationally, I'd be the person that's Okay, but you've it. also written for other... Yes, uh, on my personal level, that's my professional. I am a blogger. Okay. I've got my own blog. Uh, it's called Something Me Personified. Uh, previous to that, I'm a contributor and woman, 24. I've written for Huffington Post as well as a guest writer. But prior to that, I've been my own talk show host on Radio Peter Maritzburg and motivational speaker, edited a book. So it's been writing is my passion. Okay, so on, on the lighter side, is there a fun way of writing or advertising an aeroplane or aviation? Yes, there is. <laughs> my, you know, when I took over the actual portfolio that I'm currently doing, everything was done in a standard way. And I am creative. I love painting and art. So I brought a lot of um, colors into the adverts. And sometimes okay. my boss would look at it and say to me, uh, are we putting this color in? And I'm like, yes, I am. Yeah. Why? And he'll say, no, it's just different. And I said, I love different yes. because I think it's just, you know, I'm creative and I want it to be different and catchy. That's wonderful. Now, Samaya, you need to tell us a little bit about yourself and about your professional experience as well. Okay. Uh, my name is Samaya Kola. Um, I worked as a project manager for an IT company. Um, but due to personal reasons, I mean, uh, due to my health, actually, I was medically boarded uh, three years ago. So, and since then, I've been working with the Pulmonary Hypertension Association of South Africa, serving as their vice chairperson. Okay, so what is this medical condition and in what way does it restrict you? Um, pulmonary hypertension is actually a rare a degenerative um, Degenerative. It's a rare deteriorative disease right. uh, where, whereby it affects the arteries of the lungs, mm -hmm. where they become narrowed, and because of the narrowing, the blood pressure rises, which causes um, 
uh, strain or puts a strain on the right side of the heart, making mm -hmm. it uh, difficult for blood to get uh, to, to be pumped in the rest of the, the, or the muscles of the body. Okay, so I see that you have um, this pipe that is connected to you. What, what is it doing and, and do you have to walk around with it every day? Okay, this here is actually a cannula that connects to a portable oxygen concentrator yeah. which carries um, oxygen to me because I don't have, my body doesn't, my lungs doesn't uh, utilize digits. enough oxygen. Okay. Um, and so to compensate for that uh, lack of oxygen I have to wear um, extra or, or additional oxygen. Okay. So, and so how did you respond to this when you found out about it? Um, I was actually diagnosed with it when I was 14 years old. Wow, I, okay. I was very young. I was in the middle of high school. So I was very overwhelmed. Mm. And I think what scared me even more is when I was, was initially diagnosed, the doctors told me that, um, or not actually, actually me, they told my family that I, they, they should prepare themselves because they don't expect me to love to see my 20th birthday. Yeah, no, okay. And uh, for me, when I found out, it, like, uh, it terrified me. Um, I didn't know how to react to it. And then I was also one of, they told me I was one of seven people in South Africa that had the condition. So I knew nothing about it. I knew so nobody. So there were seven people? Seven people. In, in the South, entire South Africa? In the entire South Africa okay. that had the condition. Mm -hmm. And so, I, like I said, I, I knew nothing about mm -hmm. the disease. I knew nobody that had it. Mm -hmm. I, I felt very alone, very I overwhelmed. Imagine. I was young, and then I thought I wasn't going to see adulthood. And but, but your story says something totally different. I mean, from that moment where you were yes. to where you are now, yes. it's, it's, a, it's a complete change. It's almost as if you've undergone uh, a full reblown understanding of yourself and where you are today. Yes, I have. I, I, I mean, <coughs> from where I was, um, the 13 years ago, I've, really, I've, I've sort of grown into my own person, into a confident young woman that's determined to achieve anything, anything I put my mind to. If I want to do something, um, I've learned, uh, I, I would want to do it. I've learned mm -hmm. not to be scared. I used to be very scared to do things, and um, I don't allow those constraints anymore. But it's normal to feel, to feel afraid, course, to be scared, of isn't course. it? I yes. mean, it's natural. It, 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 of course it's natural. Yes. I mean, uh, it, it, my, dom my medical professionals always tell me that, that if you weren't scared, there would be something really wrong, wrong yes. with you, and that would be something to worry about. So, I mean, the, I do have that fear at times, um, but I don't allow it to overwhelm me. You could say there are many people who have other conditions, maybe not the same as you, yes. but who face similar kind of challenges. Yes. How do you move from a state of fear to a state of acceptance and then to excelling as you have got? Alhamdulillah. For me, I've, I've been through stages and different phases of my life where there were times where I, I like when initially, like I said, in at diagnosis, I was extremely scared. Mm -hmm. And then I sort of came to a point where I said I would put my reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, to work out all Allah. And whatever happens to me, happens to me, I have no control over it. Mm -hmm. And move forward from there. And then I'll have, like, I'll come to that acceptance and I'll move, like, move forward with my life. And then I'll have a. Uh, a stage where I, There's a I setback maybe? yes, I say mm -hmm. I have a setback, mm -hmm. and so again I go into sort of like um, I I I I'm sorry, I'm forgetting again. Okay. I I sort of go go back into like uh, uh, um, where I was mm -hmm. in anxiety. Like I I I've become very anxious. I become very um, not sort of depression. I haven't been. And that stage, and inshallah, I never ever want to get to that yes. point where I become depressed. Mm. Um, but I do become anxious. I lose hope to a point. But alhamdulillah, I find my way back from that. Alhamdulillah. And I think that part of these challenges plays in different ways, Safiya. I think also in the way mm -hmm. women manifest the challenges that they face. And even in a marriage, ultimately, it Although you, you're marrying your partner, but in many cases you married the family too, and you carry mm. your family too. So I suppose family support plays a very important role, isn't it? Definitely. Um, I think, especially for a Muslim woman, mm. I think as, you know, when you read through the book, 
and you, you go through people's personal narratives of their lives, of marriage beyond, um, you realize that you're not just marrying the person, you're marrying their family. And, and a lot of people might debate that, but mm. you, if you're lucky enough, you're going to get a good bunch of in-laws. I got married very young. I was 20. When I wrote the chapter, I was no longer, I was in the process of going through the breakup. And, um, but I'm thankful that I'm still friends with my in-laws and I'm still friendly with my ex and mm. we have an amicable relationship. And I think it all do boils down to maturity and acceptance. And so you speak about this maturity, this acceptance, um, but you also raise an important question which in my mind I feel needs to be asked. Do you feel that we're still in that stage where, you know, like many things that are taboo, the divorce is still considered taboo? Or sh or, uh, is there a, a movement towards an understanding that, you know what, sometimes people just don't get along and that we should recognize these incompatibilities and rather part in a good way, as the Quran says, you know, that, that to, to reconcile or to part in a good way is better than to stay and to destroy each other. So in terms of that, in terms of where you are now, have we come to that point where we are able to, to, to not look at divorce as taboo? Very quickly, I think, after yeah. to break. Uh, um, I, well, my motto in life is uh, love all, hate none. Yes. Simply putting it. So if things don't work out, you have to accept that. And if one person is not happy, for me personally, you can't force them to be in something. So divorce is a stigma that's huge. Um, and it sticks mainly with the woman. But I think um, it's around. And we need to accept that as Muslim women. And the families need to accept that as well. And I think part of, uh, of that acceptance is about understanding yourself. And as you have written here in the chapter, and you've got some of my favorite quotes here, yes. I think, by, by Rumi. But let's just mention the first one is the Sufi says, the more you look for the Almighty, the more you find yourself. So let's try and find ourselves. It's my uh, program's aptly called Finding Me. We'll see you after the break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to the second segment of Finding Me in the ITV Networks today with my very special guests Safiya Ismail and Sumaya Kola. Both uh, individuals have contributed to writing the Samusa Express. Now before we went on to the break Safiya, I, I quoted one of the favorite quotes by um, the Sufis and it says the more you look for the Almighty the more you find yourself and I see that your, your chapter is also entitled from the depths of my soul so a lot of tazkiyat to nafs <laughs> and searching I suppose and then yeah. of course where you mention here where Rumi says I looked in temples churches and mosques but I found the divine within my heart Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in the Quran. So, so where does the searching come from? And, and, and do you find it is necessary even in a marriage? I, I think um, it takes me back uh, to my younger years where, you know, you go to Madrasa and you taught the Quran in Arabic. And I'm somewhat of a rebel. My mom was widowed at 38 with five children to raise. Okay. My, I was five at the time when my dad passed away. So my mom tried the best to send us to do everything perfectly. And I questioned it. I wanted to know, you could have taught me the Quran in French or Spanish. It would not, I'm not saying I'm questioning my deen. Hmm. I'm saying I didn't understand it. And I think you start searching for answers. And if you read my chapter, you'll see my search began. Because mine is not so much about the marriage, it's more about finding myself and my identity. And what did, who was Allah to me? What did my deen mean to me? And I didn't want it to be indoctrinated into me. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go on the self-discovery, like how we go on a trip and we want to go and look for different relics. I wanted that with my deen. And when you become a mother, you're not responsible for someone. Mm. And you need to educate this child. And if you don't have an understanding of your own deen, 
Which is, which is true. It makes sense what you say about this journey of self-discovery. And, and that's what finding me is about also, is that how do you identify? How do you find others? How do you share with others if you don't even know what you have within you to share, isn't it? Like, it's this whole potential. How do you even share Islam if you don't even know for yourself what ex- actually Islam means and the meaning behind this religion? So, mm-hmm. so that's where you started. Yes, definitely. And I, I consulted with, with my cousin, who's Irshad Sufi from mm-hmm. Peter Maritzburg. And um, I said to him, I want to know, is it so bad to, 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 to meditate, to read the Quran in English? And he was so amazing because he said, no. Who said you can't do that? Yeah, of course. Who said you, Who can't, said you can't, do can't do that? I yeah. mean, I, I said, but the, the imam at the madrasa said, no, you will read it like this. So I went and I bought myself an English Quran. Mm-hmm. And I started reading it. Just remember, it's like a long time ago. I don't want to give off my age. <laughs> so yeah, it was a long time ago. And because my mother read it in Arabic, and she was steadfast in it, and um, her, my aunts did it. And so you just follow suit and until you get to a point in your life and you say, stop the bus. I want to discover this for myself. And that's what my yeah, chapter so, so is about. So you don't want just the, the scenery to pass you by. You want yes, to enjoy it. Yes, I want it, to enjoy it, yeah. definitely. Uh, as may, I think while Safiya is speaking about the searching and this, you know, reflecting within oneself, I'm sure that must have been a, a huge part of your life as well. And uh, perhaps as a young person, as a teenager, it's only natural to say, why me? What do I do? What have I done? And all of those questions. And then how do you unpack that? And, and then come to this, like I said initially, this acceptance because tawakkal to Allah wherever I am it is because Allah has ordained that for yes. me um, actually could relate a lot to what mm. Sophia was saying in terms of you know when you go out there you want to understand more about your religion and not just the basics and I think from a young age and I don't know if it was because of my ustads um, but they instill that that sort of yearning to learn mm-hmm. uh, beyond what you're supposed to know. So when I was in Majasa in my early years, it wasn't just, you know, learn the Quran, learn the Hadith, or learn this, or, or, so or learn wrote, the Sikh, or learn memory, yeah, yeah. history. It's learn the inner stories, mm. learn the tafsir of the Quran, learn the tafsir of the Hadith, not just what the Hadith is, but what mm. does it mean to you? Mm. And for me, that played a big part in my later life. Um, when I be, when I when I actually became really ill three years ago, that's actually I, I think where my life really really changed. Mm. Is um, I was at a point where my heart was I, I was in heart failure, and um, the doctors started talking about heart and lung transplants, and I was terrified. I didn't know what to do with my life, and I think within the same time I lost my grandmother, who was very close to. And during that period of time, I, I think I did the most soul searching I've ever done in my entire life. I said, and I said, you know, I, I'm going to learn as much as I can. I'm going to have a connection to my Creator that no one can, that nobody or no illness can take away from me. Oh, yes. And I remember the first thing that happened is actually that was one of my darkest periods mm. is because I actually suffered with severe, severe anxiety at that time and I started seeing a psychologist and the first thing she told me, she, um, go and sit on your musala mm-hmm. and tell God, because she, she was a white woman and she said, tell God, take your heart out in a figurative manner and say, I'm handing my heart over to you, mm. you are in control of my life. And I remember sitting and doing that <laughs> on my musala. And I, 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 you know, they say you have those deep conversations with Allah. Yes. Don't just sit on the musala after your salah and start reading parrot fashion. Rabbana atina fi dunya Have conversations with Allah. Mm-hmm. And till now, my teachers still instill that in us. Have those those intimate conversations with Allah. He's your best friend. He's your, even in the Quran, He tells you, I am your. Mm-hmm. I am your guiding, protecting friend. Yes. Turn to me. And he also says in the Quran, O Fawi, do Amri ila Allah, you know, there's a verse, I hand over my matter to Allah yes. subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that's exactly what you've done. O Fawi, do Amri ila Allah, I've handed over. And when you hand over to Allah, I mean, who is there? Which, no, nobody, nobody greater, no protector, more powerful than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to manage yes. your affairs. And, the, and that's the right place. You've lodged it in the right yes. place. And uh, subhanAllah, I think from there, you take ownership. Yes. But now, you've also, in your introduction, mentioned a challenging phase in your life. 
that mm. you've moved from marriage to divorce as well, subsequent mm. to this. Definitely. Um, yeah. How do you deal with this and, and what is the advice that you would like to give to Muslim women in terms of their relationships and understanding compatibility, incompatibility? I think, I think because there's a stigma <coughs> excuse me, um, around divorce, so women, especially Muslim women, feel it's such a negative thing. And it actually is a liberation sometimes. It's setting a person free. And I think where I come from, I mean, being a motivational speaker, you want to be happy and you want the other person to be happy. And you can't have two unhappy people in one home. Hmm. And it's not good for yourself, it's not good for your partner, and it's definitely not good for children. And I know people always say that you need to stick together for your kids. What damage are you doing? Yes. And what damage are you doing to yourself? And I think you have to love yourself a lot. And I think Nadia actually summed that up in her previous chat. If you don't love yourself, then you're actually going to do damage. And you and, can't give love. And you can't give love. Mm. And I'm actually thankful because you hear of many stories from families and friends how bad a relationship can get. And I'm thankful that mine didn't get that bad. And, you know, you part. You've written here, again by Romy, there is a candle in your heart ready to be kindled. There is a void in your soul ready to be filled. You feel it, don't you? And when I read this, uh, and I relate it to what you've just said, I think it, the ability to recognize that, okay, if we're not compatible anymore, that we can head to a divorce and it can be a liberation, can only come from that point of view when you understand that you're your own person, isn't it? That you, your own person, you take your own happiness, that not somebody else can give it to you, and that your world is not dependent on another, but that it is dependent on the divine. Definitely. So Let the work go again. Uh, yes. And you're actually handing that over mm. because he brought you to that point and he's going to take you through it. And, and In the Malosri Yusra. Exactly. Yes. And, you know, as I say, um, like I was saying, saying to someone, when you look for a partner, you say, I want somebody to complete me. Mm -hmm. Actually, I don't say I'm, I want somebody to complete me. I'm complete me. already. I'm complete. I want somebody to enhance me. Compliment me. Yes, so and have, make me a better yeah. person. I'm, I'm already sorry. a good person. Yes, we I'm all are good. We all but have But we can that. always improve. Exactly. Yes. And that's what I need. And I think that's where a lot of younger women go wrong. They're looking for somebody to complete me. Now, coming to something different for you, Samaya, and I think this is because I want to touch specifically to the parents and to the younger children. Generally, the children can be very selfish yes. and children can be hurtful. Yes. So when you discovered, I mean, you said you were 14 years old, also in those precious teen years, did you find that the children were accommodating and kind towards you? Or did you find that you had to deal with an obstacle in terms of first your own physical illness and then the emotions that came from the other children? Um, Alhamdulillah, I mean, w w when I was 14, I had a group of friends. I was very particular about who I became friends with. Um, and I had a group of friends that really stuck by me. And they never really questioned me or said, OK, no, we don't want to be with you because you're sick or whatever. And, I, and alhamdulillah, I mean, I love most of my teenage years, even though I, I, I was sick initially, I loved m very, very normally. Right. Um, it's only because it's a deteriorative disease that over the years I noticed that I, I didn't have as much energy as I used to have and I started struggling with my breathing and a lot of other things. But at that age, alhamdulillah, I had a very supportive network of friends. That uh, I mean, I'm still friends with most of them up, t up until now. They keep in touch with me. So generally, you've been blessed. I suppose from that moment where you realize, where you hand over to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he puts good people in your path, doesn't okay, he? No, alhamdulillah. Okay, alhamdulillah. you wrote, only he is my creator, is the best of all planners. Yes. And is that a, a revolutionary thought, or has it been unfolding as you gradually came to terms with everything in your life? I think it, it's, it's also something that, that gradually unfolded over the years, is that I realized that your life is like a puzzle, and mm. everything fits perfectly together, that sometimes we may not understand why certain things happen. Um, for example, like my story in the book, Based on Marriage, is, is actually uh, my fear of marriage mm -hmm. because of what I've experienced with my, my mother um, being abused um, in both marriages and um, so for me, it's taking all those aspects and, and understanding that everything in our lives, even that, 
had a purpose. Mm. That everything had made me stronger for what I am, what I am facing now. Today, yes. And what I, inshallah, yeah. I will face in the future. Because, I mean, I still have my transplant to go through and I still have a lot of things to go through. But the good news is, in the mall, you're still after In the mall, very after day, after every yeah. hardship, there'll be ease. And I believe that with my entire heart. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, La you califullahu nafsan illa wa saha, you know. We'll never place the burden on you greater than you can bear. So you are one of those amazing people whom he has chosen to show, hey people, look, here is a young, beautiful, dynamic woman who has said, Ufawidu amri lallah, I've handed over my matter to Allah, take it, accept it, and respect it. Well, we've come to the close almost. I would like both of you to leave us with parting comments, and perhaps we can start with you, Sophia. I, um, please get a copy of the writing with the Samosa Express. It's a beautiful compilation from 27 brilliant women. You know, when Zahira approached me to write for the book, I, the first thing I said to her, I don't have a degree, I'm not professional. But she says, you have a story to tell. Mm. And I think every single woman has, has a, a story, story to, to tell. tell. Agreed. And we are all writers. Mm. So get yourself a copy and read and share. And from your experiences and your engagements with Rumi, what would you like to I know? love Rumi. Yes. I'm like, I, I quote Rumi all the time. And I, when I write in Woman 24, that's not a Muslim um, platform. It's a multifaceted platform. I still quote Rumi. So I just, you know, love all and hate none. That's just my motto in life. And, and, and malice to none. Malice to none. Malice so to Allah, none. And that is also a Quranic teaching. If you should know that uh, Rumi is the most read poet in the mm. Western world. Mm. And what about you, Samir? Um, for me, I would also advise anyone out there to go and get the book. And where do we get the it's books from? It's a brilliant read. You, yeah, you can mm. get it at exclusive books, at Scoops, um, at Monte Casino, and we have an online um, we have online sales at Amazon.com. Uh, we also have a Facebook page with a list of authors mm. that sell the books. Okay, and, and, and some advice to people when they face challenges, what would you say? My <coughs> advice to them would be, no, don't give up hope. We, you know, as long as you are alive, and as long as you have, um, you have, um, I'm sorry, I wouldn't say, okay, just life. As long as you have been blessed with, with any amount of capability, you have the, the ability to, to make something of your life and mm. to carry on living. And, um, there's a, a, I love the quote by Stephen Hawking where he says, where there is life, there is hope. And Hello. that's how you, you, everybody mm. should live their lives, is that n y there is always hope in life. And Allah has made it that way, mm. that always have hope in Him. And if it's not in this world, have hope in the year after. after yes. And um, marriage, like everything, is in Allah's hands. Mm. So those who aren't married know that Allah has a plan for you. And if you are not meant to get married in this world, then Allah has something even better for you in Akhirah. I mean, Jazakallah Khair. And I think the final parting comment that I would like to leave our viewers with is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's own words in the Quran, where he says, that never be despondent on the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. And in any circumstance, in any situation, whether it's illness, marriage, divorce, uh, family challenges, children, whatever it is, financial, never be despondent on the mercy of mm -hmm. Allah. So with that, Jazakallah Khair for being here and for sharing your intimate thoughts with us. Fiyamani Allah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.